I am so thrilled to be here on our Towards Health podcast. My name is Brian Brown, and I serve as the Regional Vice President of Trial Landscape. Today, I'm joined by an industry veteran uh, and former colleague, Mr. Travis Caudill. Uh, Travis, I would love to learn a little bit more about your background and your journey into feasibility, along with your current role at ICON. Would you mind introducing yourself to our viewers I'd and love listeners? To. I'd love to, Ryan. And I love that uh, my journey in the industry uh, included a time working with you and excited uh, to be chatting with you today. Uh, so I, I joined the industry maybe through an unconventional route. I actually worked for a health insurance company. Uh, and so I was working at a health insurance company and specifically I got placed overseeing a data modernization project where we were moving our claims data. This is gonna age me like tech has come so far away. We were on this like MS-DOS based system, state of the art, you know, 1989, you know, but we were moving to a Windows based, you know, .NET framework, you know, so, and, and when we talk about data migration, you know, like today, the wizards do this in no time. I was managing a group of people who were keying data from one system into another system. So this was completely low tech. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we were working with actuarial sciences and they were wanting to combine claims data from the old data set with claims data from the new set. And I, I began to, to become a bit by requirement an expert on how these data sets were structured and how to pull data sets together for an analysis. And I, I ended up connecting with some folks at Kindle uh, who, who were based in my hometown of Cincinnati, Ohio, and they were really interested in leveraging claims data to support their late phase business. And, you know, I was really excited about the opportunity and I've been in the industry, you know, working on feasibility and site identification, you know, ever since really just fascinated about how we leverage data to make better decisions. And, you know, there's been just massive consolidation in the industry. Like we're still seeing a lot of M&A activity even today. So, you know, I started at Kindle, which at the time I thought was a big company, you know, but then they got gobbled up by INC on its way uh, to become Cineos. And uh, I've also had a, a great opportunity to work uh, at Worldwide, which also experienced tremendous growth while I was there. And just recently, you know, was acquired at a private equity sale you know, and now I'm at uh, Icon, which uh, following the acquisition of PRA you know, is, is one of the largest CROs in the world. And it's it's just been in incredible at every stage of my journey. You know, the principles of using data to drive decision making, they have held true. But man, there's so much more data today than there was 18 years ago you know, when I started on this journey. And so it's really exciting. You have been at the forefront of so many different uh, iterations of our utilization of data and the cutting edge. You know, it's the start of a new year. So I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about what we learned in 2023 and what's coming in 2024 when it comes to data-driven clinical tracks. So I think everyone in 2023, you know, is just been fascinated by AI. Uh, you know, the, the realization that AI is going to be transformative in multiple areas of our life, you know, including our work and including clinical trials uh, and even just patient care. You know, so I think, you know, all of 2023 was really an opportunity to step back and think about the role that that technology is going to have and to, to start thinking about pragmatically, where do we start? How do we, how do we channel this excitement into, you know, some exciting avenues? You know, I'll say that uh, my journey with AI started a little bit earlier. You know, back in 2020, we introduced our first AI product. So in 2023, we were thinking about, you know, how do we build on a platform you know, that we already have? How can we feed more data into an existing AI product? And then do we need to place sort of a generative AI layer to what we're doing, you know, to help teams better conceptualize you know, the data coming out of our model. So, you know, I think 2023 has been focused on AI and I think 
2024, I think we're going to continue to see that focus. But I also think that as an industry, we are a bunch of natural skeptics. You know, we love ROI, you know, so I think we're already looking at how this explosion of AI technology, how's it making a difference in our ability to deliver trials to patients, you know, in our ability to enroll those trials more quickly, you know, and, and honestly get to answers. You know, the goal at the end of the day is to bring new treatments to market or to find out what's not working so that we can reallocate R&D dollars to the next drug that could work for these patients. So I think we're going to see kind of that passion and excitement for AI meet that tough customer perspective we have of wanting to see good ROI on those investment dollars. So I'm really glad that you raised that, Travis, because we are um, very much skeptics in this industry uh, and definitely have to deliver that ROI. So I'm curious. Well, Ryan, you know, look, from your look how long it took us to embrace EDC. You know, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think anyone imagines a, a paper, a paper CRF uh, anymore. But, you know, we were we were really hesitant as an industry to, to let go of our paper CRFs. And so, you know, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how we how quickly we change, you know, how quickly we're able to adapt now. From paper CRFs to e-consent, and it's interesting, right, that you've been kind of dabbling in some of this stuff uh, even in 2020. So I think it leads me to to ask the the question, which is, you know, how much of this do you think is hype versus reality uh, for how it will change the way clinical trials are run? So I think it's a lot of reality. I think what's hype is the pace at which this is going to happen, right? You know, what I've learned you know, working with a, a machine learning data model is that it takes a lot of thinking, you know, the the ability of the AI to parse massive amounts of data and to give us insights that we couldn't see alone. It's there, but it's not easy. You know, it's not like, you know, going and, and asking, you know, chat GPT to, you know, help me create a picture of the perfect clinical trial. Well, it'll generate a nice picture for you, but it's far from solving all the challenges we have you know, on clinical trials. We've been focusing on some of the products I've been working on, on just bringing down the percentage of sites that don't enroll any subjects on our clinical trial. And we've made great progress in that stride, you know, but the environment we have today is also very different than the environment in 2020. Uh, with the pandemic. And so, you know, the challenges today are, are actually very different on the site side. You know, a lot of sites are experiencing, you know, resourcing shortages, and they're having to divert resources that have traditionally been applied to clinical research to other areas of patient care. And so we've had to think, how do we evolve our AI model to account for this new information? You know, and then as we've all... <clears throat> As we've also had a lot of interest in diversity and inclusion, now it's not only about uh, selecting the sites that will put patients on studies, but making sure we get the right mix of patients, that we're giving a true representative sampling uh, of the U.S. population in the patients we're enrolling. Uh, and, and what I found is that there's no, there's just no mission accomplished banner to be had anywhere. It's about lots of iterations. It's about trying and seeing what's working and what's not working. And it's about developing partnerships with data providers to bring new data sets in and to see how does this data help build on the model we already have. And I think that's exciting. But again, I think a lot of people think, you know, next year, 2024, AI is going to solve everything you know, I think I think there are, we're a lot of work away from reaching the summit of the mountain. And we definitely have a ways to go, um, but it, it seems like as an industry, we're, we're all collectively trying to take those steps. Uh, and I'm glad that you mentioned the concept of partnership, especially when I think about when it comes to selecting the ideal site, right? And what ideal site selection even means and, and looks like, especially uh, in the landscape where so much technology is available to us. 
you know, how can we better leverage technology to advance our efforts with diversity and also maybe addressing some of those clinical trial processes that might be able to reduce some of the burden to the site? No, I think you've hit the nail on the head with, with your comments there. You know, what we're finding is that because of the stress sites are under and the resource constraint, they're really looking at clinical trials as an opportunity to provide a care option to their patients. And they're wanting to make sure with the limited capacity that they have, that they're choosing options that can benefit most of their patients or more of their patients, you know? And so, you know, I think when we do a good job of matching a clinical trial opportunity to the patient population that a site has, you know, if we have a particular drug that we think is going to have an increased efficacy profile within a particular demographic, and we can match that drug and that clinical trial with a site that's serving the needs of those patients, that's really, really powerful. You know, I, I in my own journey, it's been really rewarding working on a number of lupus protocols and lupus disproportionately affects black people and specifically black women who oftentimes are in a season of their life where they have caregiver responsibilities for children and family. And being able to make this study available to those populations and to work with the sites, how do we support these patients on their journey? You know, how do we support a patient who has caregiving responsibilities? You know, and how do we make this study easier? I think that's where the, the technology first helps us place the study in the right location. And then it helps us put the right sorts of solutions around that site to support both the site and those patients to make it easy for those patients to come in. And one of the, the ways we're seeing AI technology sort of make a difference is in really helping us optimize the, the protocol design and the schedule of events. How can we capture the data that we need in the least invasive way possible? Yeah, so that we are giving patients more of their life back and making it easier for them to be in the clinical trial. And I think we're seeing, you know, and, and this is probably one of the most positive things I think that's come out of the pandemic. You know, we're seeing the adoption of DCT trial elements on a lot of our studies, you know, to make it a little bit easier. So, you know, I think it's about making sure that we do a good job matching our study opportunities to the right sites who have the right patients and then I think it's about leveraging all the tools that we have, AI and otherwise, to just make it as easy for those patients and sites as possible. Um, you hit on so much there. Uh, and I know that we could spend a whole other hour just unpacking everything that you broke down um, right there. But I'm really glad that you um, hit on the point that um, technology can point us to the areas where patients who are most in need uh, might be. And then the other layer to that is aligning the right resources to ensure that the sites that may have historically been overlooked can actually thrive um, with the protocol uh, and support their patients and actually being able to participate and enroll and, and to empower these sites to be able to offer clinical trials as a care option uh, to the right patient population at the right time. So I'm, I'm really glad that you hit on that, including with trial design, um, which has a big impact on our ability to find the right sites and be able to enroll the patients. Um, so I want to be mindful as well of your time and of our, our time. Um, are there any kind of closing thoughts that you have as it pertains to um, the role of AI technology and, and the look ahead and, and what you're most excited about? So, you know, the, the thing that strikes me is that AI is allowing us to ask better questions than ever before, but it's incumbent on us to ask the questions. You know, it's enabling an extension of human intelligence, you know, but uh, I, I think there's been this idea that we can leverage AI a bit to disengage, to make our lives easier. You know, my life has gotten more complex since AI, <laughs> you know, but it's been great because we're asking and answering better questions, you know, and 
you know, what we've really learned on our journey, you know, with AI and with this disruptive technology is that it's okay to be a little bit uncomfortable. You know, it's okay to not know exactly, you know, how things are going to work out. I think experimentation is really, really important as we're on this cutting edge. Uh, and again, I want to talk about the importance of selecting good partners and the importance of having good dialogue about what's going on. There's where we need to come together, I think, as a community through opportunities like this podcast and others to talk about what we're doing, what we're trying, what's working, what's not working. And I think that collective commitment will return a, a lot of, of dividends for all of us as we sort of ride the AI wave. And again, we try to expedite you know, treatments for our patients. That was really well said. And, you know, as I think about our listeners who might be uh, diving into this, you know, some of the things that were discussed as far as, you know, technology, we need to embrace it instead of being terrified of it. Um, being able to have a safe space to actually uh, experiment, to try, to ask the big questions, especially now that we've got so many great data sets, it's getting more robust to where we can ask a little bit more nuanced questions to actually help us make better informed decisions and strategies, especially as we're designing the studies, and then also to inform where we go, why we go where we go, uh, and how to best support the patients and the sites that are being served by, by these uh, new innovations. So I am extremely grateful for your time, Travis, and your insights uh, on this very important and salient topic. And I'm looking forward to the next wave of what we can do collectively as an industry to um, just continue to innovate and leverage the best that we can. And so, you know, I guess my big ask to the broader community is uh, empower our people to be able to ask those questions of the technology, um, to be mindful that the ROI, it might be very incremental in value. So setting the right goals to measure whether or not something's working instead of it being uh, all or nothing. Cause that's one of the big concerns I think that I see is if people don't see an immediate return on some of this in, in AI, they might abandon it. Whereas, you know, we're just getting started. We're kind of on the cutting edge and in, in infancy in some of this stuff. Um, so Travis, uh, final food for thought, any last wrap ups or any three key tips that you'd like to leave your fellow colleagues and feasibility that are looking at um, how to best utilize technology and, and inform the best decisions of why to go where they go. So three, three key tips, I'll keep them quick. Number one, be curious. Number two, ask questions. And number three, remember that the patients are at the center of everything we do, you know, even especially at the center of the planning stage of the study where we have such a huge impact as feasibility professionals. I have nothing else. You just kind of dropped the mic there. So thank you so much, Travis, for your time and your intentionality. Um, and I appreciate you. Until the Thanks, next Ray. one. Thanks, Ray. It's awesome. Okay. Awesome.